بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to our Thursday class. And it was supposed to be our ninth class studying the Islamic faith. But um, inshallah, we will devote the whole um, segment, today's class, to answering some of the questions that we have received from you on Facebook. So Sania says, I want to know whether it is halal to fill the gap between the teeth. The gap between the teeth, we don't have any hadith that restricts it, except the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him. And it's in the Sahih. And it's a well-known hadith where he tells us how the Prophet ﷺ cursed a number of women for mutilating and changing the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal, such as those who are tattoo artists and those who they practice their art on. So both the recipient and the doer are cursed by Allah Azza wa Jal and cursed by the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. He also cursed those who connect their hair with other hair. Those who do it, the hairdressers, and the, those who it's done to the clients. Among those, the Prophet والسلام, cursed those who file their teeth. This means that they make a gap between their teeth as it was a sign of beauty in the past that you have a gap between the front two teeth. So they used to file it. And the Prophet ﷺ followed cursing those who do this by saying, وَالْمُتَفَلِّجَاتِ لِلْحُسْنِ الْمُغَيِّرَاتِ خَلْقَ اللَّهِ Those who do this gapping or filing to their teeth so that they would look more beautiful and they change the creation of Allah. This is how Allah created you. Changing it permanently like this would be curse worthy. And as we see from Sania's uh, um, uh, question, she's saying about filling the gap, not making one. And usually if there is a gap in the teeth nowadays, this is considered to be an abnormality. However, we have to go to the dentists and we have to ask normal people if such a normal gap is a deformity or it's a normal thing. And the vast majority of people would say it's a normal thing. And maybe some would differ and say that this is more beautiful than filling it up. And hence, that would be prohibited because it's changing and altering the creation of Allah. However, if a dentist or dentists or specialists said that such a gap is bad for your teeth, it allows cavity to grow, it uh, brings pl plaque or plaque or whatever they call it, and it may store food in it, etc. So filling it up is the correct procedure. In this case, this is totally permissible, inshallah. Madiha says, I had my breakfast while I was fasting, voluntary fast, nafil. After two hours, I remember my fast. I continued fasting thereafter. Is my fast valid or I need to make it up again? 
The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever eats or drinks while fasting out of forgetfulness, Allah has given him food and drink. What does that mean? It means that this is a gift from Allah to anyone who is fasting and eats or drinks out of forgetfulness. Yet this does not mean if I see someone fasting and he's drinking or eating, it doesn't mean that I should leave him alone because Allah is feeding him and providing him with drinks. No, I have to enjoy virtue and righteousness and forbid evil and vice by telling him, Akhi, you are fasting so that he would refrain. Therefore, um, Madiha, this is not affecting your fasting. This is totally okay, inshallah. Muntaha says, I have a question. And to make a long story short, um, her father-in-law gave her a portion from his house as a mahar, a dowry. And now he has sold the house without her permission, which means that he also sold her portion of the house. And he is blackmailing his son, his son and telling them that he would not give them a penny. The son is obedient, doesn't want to hurt his father's feelings, but at the same time, he borrowed, that is the father, from his son, 380 rupees, uh, lakh rupees, and used it without telling her husband and spending the money of the house on his new wife and children. What does Islam say about such a problem? First of all, this father-in-law of yours has committed a grave sin by depriving you of your haq mahar. And Muslims, when they promise they fulfill. Hypocrites, when they promise, they break. This portion of the house, which was allocated as a mahar, is your right to claim it. So let's assume that at the time of selling the house, it costed, let's say, $10,000, the portion that is yours. This is a debt that he is supposed to give to you. And actually the debt is on your husband because he's the one obliged to give you the mahar. So if he failed to deliver the mahar due to his father's betrayal and dishonesty, then it remains with your husband to give it to you whenever it's possible or for you to forgive your husband that. Your father-in-law is a cheater and a liar and he's a crook. But now you're faced with a problem either to take him and your husband to court demanding your right or to act wisely and especially when your husband is a good man to separate your financials from your father-in-law totally so you advise your husband that you require the mahar from him and that he has to pay more attention in the future to his family to his wife and children's rights, rather than squandering and spending off his wealth on his father who is 
a spendthrift and does not fear Allah Azza wa Jal and Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala knows best. Madiha again says the sealed nectar by Safiuddin Mubarak Furi. Is it authentic? The answer is the books of Sira are not all 100% authentic as in the case of the books of Hadith, for example. So when you say, is Bukhari authentic? Is Sahih Muslim authentic? I said, yeah, no doubt in that. However, the books of Tafsir, the books of Sira, these books, due to the fact that they collect a lot of narrations and they do not implement the rules of schools or scholars of hadith. Therefore, you may find things that are authentic, things that are not. However, in general, the sealed nectar or the rahiq al maktoum is a well accepted book in Sira. And to my knowledge, it won the, the award of King Faisal's um, award for service of Islam. And it is among the widely accepted books of Sira for being concise and at the same time for having a, a mostly authentic narrations and, and, and stories in it. Therefore, inshallah, it, I would be safe in saying that, yes, you can go ahead and read it. Yusuf Siddiqui says, how to reply to non-Muslims when they say, Assalamu alaikum. Should we just say, wa alaikum? The answer is yes. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, whenever the Jews used to come to greet him and say, Assalamu alaikum, they alter the salam, they would say, wa alaikum. And the Prophet, alayhi salam, prohibited us from initiating salam. So we may never say to a non-Muslim, Assalamu alaikum. But if they say to us, and they start by saying, Assalamu alaikum, we may reply by saying, Wa alaikum, full stop. And this is the most authentic opinion, though there are differences of opinions among scholars, but this is the most authentic and closest to the Sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi as-salatu wassalam. Um, engineer Iqtidar says, if parents are forcing daughter for khul'a, is that khul'a valid by court? First of all, the issues of divorce and khul'a, the parents of both sides have no say in it. So the father of the wife has no say in demanding divorce or khul'a for his daughter. This is something between a man and his wife. So you, the question doesn't make any sense. If parents are forcing daughter, is that valid by court? The answer is no. Unless the daughter goes and demands khul'a in front of the judge without any indication that he's, she's being forced by her parents. The judge is a human being. He sees a woman coming and demanding khul'a from her husband. He does his due diligence, talks to the husband, talks to the girl, try to reconcile, but she's adamant and insisting on khul'a. How would he know that she's forced? There's no possibility. So if she applies for khul'a and is granted it, she has no right to come after one month and say, Judge, I was forced. Prove that to us. And he can't accept what she's saying without any proof. There is, and we spoke about this before in some of our courses, and we said that claiming that a person is forced to divorce or to do something haram, or to break an oath. The claim of being forced has to be real and genuine. 
otherwise it won't be accepted for example a person claims that he was forced to divorce his wife that's why he divorced her we say how were you divorced and he replies by saying someone said to me if you don't divorce your wife I'm gonna throw rocks on you so the judge says did he have rocks around him he said no was he capable of throwing rocks he said, no he's so thin he cannot carry rocks so why did you divorce he, said, he forced me no this is not acceptable someone says my wife forced me to divorce her she said if you don't divorce me tomorrow I'm going to throw myself in the river this divorce is invalid actually the divorce if taken place is valid why he wasn't forced she threatened to throw herself in the river tomorrow yeah tomorrow not today so this is not ikrahun mulji this is not forced um, or pressured forcing of I don't know what how do you that doesn't leave you any room to maneuver someone has a knife to your neck if you don't divorce I'm gonna slash your throat this is real threat a woman on the 10th floor hanging from the balcony or thro threatening to throw herself from the window and I know that she would do such a thing this is a valid force or a valid um, excuse to do whatever you want and it doesn't take effect therefore if the daughter was not forced as I've explained to ask for khulr, then the khulr is valid if she was forced by real threat genuine threat that is going to happen inevitably in this case the khulr is not valid but she has to clarify all of this to the judge Jannah says the question is not clear Sheikh always say Bismillah when you start do work that's why shaitan stay away for from you how about the money if you count also must say bismillah i don't think she's ask she's telling me she's asking me is that we should say bismillah before start any work no this is not true we don't say bismillah before everything we do however sometimes scholars say it is recommended to begin things by saying bismillah halal things but it's not mandatory definitely and likewise when counting money you don't say bismillah because it's not from the sunnah but if you say it there is no harm in doing it unless you think it's a form of worship you're getting closer to Allah with now for those who complain and I've seen few cases like this where people living in a, a room on their own nobody's in the house nobody has access to the house in their living room in their own cupboards or dresser they place money and come back five minutes later to find it gone and I know close people to me I know one of the well-known da'is here in Jeddah and she's in her 60s she's a very good highly decorated student of knowledge that she would suffer from this every other day and she had lost literally tens of thousands of reals and she's gone crazy she does she says I don't know what's happening and I told her that this is jinn so she says I, I recite that Baqarah I recite this I I observe my car but they steal the money sometimes they return some of it and sometimes I don't keep any cash in my house I simply take it downstairs to my daughter's house or to my neighbor's house and keep all my money with there and everything is fine only when I put it in my purse in my purse in my dresser or in my bedroom it's gone so I recommended her to say Bismillah whenever she places it and with the grace of Allah it stops 
it stopped. And only every blue moon it returns and she says, I forgot to say Bismillah. So Bismillah is something that we begin things with, not as mandatory, but rather as asking Allah for blessing of things. And again, it's not a form of worship, meaning that it's a sunnah, but the Prophet encouraged us to say Bismillah in uh, uh, almost generally speaking things that we do. So I believe that it is not mandatory, but if you say it, that would be good, inshallah. Uh, Sheikh Jabin, it, is, it hard, uh, is it prohibited to use iron ornaments for both men and women? There are many hair clips and pins which are of iron. Should we also not use them? The answer is no. There is no problem in that, inshallah. And to my recollection, the hadith where the Prophet prohibited an iron uh, ring, saying that this is the ornament of the people of hell, I believe that this is not authentic hadith or it was abrogated. Because in the other hadith, when the man wanted to marry a woman who proposed to the Prophet and the Prophet rejected her, the man said, let me marry her if you don't want her. So he asked him whether he had any financial assets to provide as a mahal, as a dowry. And in the end, the Prophet said, go and look even for a ring made of iron, which means that the hadith, it is the ornament of the people of hell, is not authentic or at least abrogated and Allah knows best. Zaid Zubair says, is there any dalil for reciting Basmala before any surah? Someone told me that there is no dalil that Basmala and Isti'adha is enough. First of all, making bold statements like this is very easy. If this individual is a highly decorated scholar of Islam, we would say, okay, maybe let's look into it. But when you look that saying Bismillah in the schools of thought is normal, accepted. Some say it's mandatory, some say it's not. Some say it is part of Al-Fatiha and some say it is not. And the most authentic opinion is that Al-Basmala. I know some of the people are saying, what is Al-Basmala? The Basmala is saying Bismillah, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, this known Basmala. And Tasbih is saying Subhanallah. Tahleel is saying La ilaha illallah. Takbir is Allahu Akbar. Tahmeed is saying Alhamdulillah. Isti'adha is to say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. Hawqalah is to say la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. This is how the Muslims refer to these phrases as a form of shortening them. So basmala, the most authentic opinion is that it's a separate ayah of its own, dividing between surahs with the exception of surah 8 and 9, surah al-anfal and surah uh, at-tawbah. Other than that, Every single surah, it has basmala in the beginning. And Surah Al-Naml has the basmala in the middle, where Sulaiman, peace be upon him, was corresponding with Sheba, the queen of, uh, I think her name is Sheba, I don't know, uh, the queen of Yemen. So to come and claim that basmala is... Uh, um, not to be recited before the surah, this is outrageous. There are a hadith related to Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father. And some say it is mawquf on Sa'id ibn Jubayr, the student of Ibn Abbas, that the Prophet, that we, the companions, did not know that, or the Prophet did not know as that the surah has finished until. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim was recited when being revealed that this to announce the beginning of a new surah. I'm not sure of 
how authentic this this uh, narration is, but it is well known in the books of jurors of Islam, scholars of Islam. And hence, it is sufficient for us to open the Mus'haf, the Quran, and find Bismillah in every beginning of the Surah. So for someone to come up with a bold claim that this is not part of the Surah or it's not part of the Quran and we don't have to recite it, we just say, A'udhu Billahi Mishtan al this is outrageous. Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I prayed behind the Prophet Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, and they all began their recitation in, in Salat with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. While acknowledging that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and Istiada to be recited before. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Amna, she says, Will the pure or good souls meet each other in the Barzakh? This is an issue of dispute among scholars. And the most authentic opinion is that it is not backed up by authentic hadiths. And hence, we cannot confirm such a thing. But let us take this argument to another level. What are the possibilities? One, that souls meet in the Barzakh. Two, they don't meet. What impact does either one have on us, on our ibadah? on us getting closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Zero. So why do we occupy our time and researching over an issue that has no value? Why do we waste time asking such, such questions that would not benefit us? Yeah, it's fun to know that, oh, my late father, will be meeting my late grandmother. But without evidence, this is fruitless. It has no benefit, and Allah Azza wa knows best. Yahya Buhari says, please, what is the ruling on countries that are not using Sharia, ah, but are both Muslims and Christians? On the Day of Judgment, Will all the Ummah go to hellfire as claimed by one scholar? And if so, what is the way out? Well, this is the core reason we are studying the Islamic faith, the Aqidah. So that we understand our Aqidah well. And through, our, through what we had uh, studied earlier, and through the um, course of fiqh, the Islamic fiqh we have done, we learn that it is not for individuals to grade and label people, whether they are among the people of hell or heaven. So what you're saying, Yahya, is that there is a scholar who claims that all of the ummah will go to hell, Definitely, this quote-unquote so-called scholar is not a scholar. He's a deviant person, and he is most likely from Al-Khawarij, who label Muslims as kafir, and who claim that such Muslims will be abiding in hell for eternity. What kind of audacity this person has to just say, the whole ummah will be in hell. Now, the issue of implementing Sharia. This is one of the most important rulings in Islam. The ruling is for Allah Azza wa Jal. The legislation is for Allah Azza wa Jal. And whoever legislates with other than what Allah has revealed, then he is among the kafirun, al-zalimun, al-fasiqun, as mentioned in chapter 5, verse 44, 45, and 47. Yet, this is an issue of great dispute among scholars, whether it is kufr, duna kufr, major kufr, minor kufr, 
or it is an act of apostasy that if a person does it automatically, he's bound to hell and he's exiting the fold of Islam. This is what we will come to discuss, inshallah, later on as we are progressing in the Islamic faith course where we spoke about what the author said, the first two of the things that nullifies a person's Islam. We will come, inshallah, hopefully on Monday to discuss and to explain the difference of opinion among scholars when it comes to legislating other than with Sharia law, which would, inshallah, hopefully benefit all of us. But in general, there is a difference between legislating and ruling and by being a citizen who has no power to object or reject. So there are the legislators, those who come and say halal haram, to something that goes against Sharia. So they are overriding Sharia law, overriding Allah's law. This is one category. Then we have the rulers who would implement such legislations, regardless whether they are okay with it, they've ordered it, they don't know about it, this is something different. We can't paint with the same brush. It's different when someone says, no, 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 this man-made law is better than Allah's law. This is kufr. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. But someone says, I believe that Allah's law is supreme, ultimate. And this man-made man law is junk. But what can I do? I'm forced to implement it. Otherwise, I'll be kicked out of office. I'll be this, I'll be that. Uh, this is separate. And the third category is us. When someone says to us, Simon says, do this. We know it's haram. We know it's against Sharia. But we can't rebel. We can't reject or object. So the least we could do is not to obey, not to confront, but not to obey unless we come to the least of the two evils. So committing the least of the two evils, this is judgmental and depends on the issue. But generally speaking, what this so-called scholar said is totally bogus and no one can just simply paint with the same brush every category of the society and put them all in hell. Uh, Rina Tony says, is this rewarding to give money to beggars? It may encourage them begging. Does Islam like this, sir? First of all, beggars, the vast majority of them are professionals. So the recommendation is not to give them because this would only make them grow in number and make them more professional. However, if someone gives any beggar, whether professional or not, money, is he rewarded? The answer is yes. Because this is his intention. Okay, I found this on the web for who are the dancers, yes. Who Check it out. Who is talking to you, Siri? Wallahi. <laughs> This is weird. It shows you how good Apple is. So if you give a beggar money, this is according to your intention. There's no problem in doing it because you're dealing with Allah. And this is why we have a lot of similar cases in Sharia where a person is rewarded according to his intention. For example, Sayyid al-Imam Bukhari, the Prophet said, while Isa ibn Maryam, peace be upon him, Jesus Christ, was walking, he saw a man stealing. So he caught him red-handed and he said to him, you stole. And the man said, wallahi, I didn't steal. Like every 
other burglar would do. They would swear, lying. Isa, peace be upon him, said, I believe in Allah because you took an oath in the name of Allah. You swore, I believe in Allah and I falsify my eyes. I will accuse my eyes that I did not see what I thought I saw. And he let him go. And the Prophet also والسلام, ruled the case similar to that. When a man went to the masjid and found someone sitting by the masjid door before Fajr, thinking that he's a beggar, so he took money and gave it to him. And then discovered that this man was his own son. So he said to him, give me back my money. I didn't intend it to you. I wanted to give it for charity. And the son said, well, I'm poor and I'm deserving of the money and I got it. I'm not going to give it back to you. <laughs> so they both went to the Prophet And this is a clear indication that taking your father, taking your mother to court to demand your rights is not part of being undutiful. This is my God-given right. So many people ask me, our father died and mother is refusing to sell the house and divide the inheritance. And she says, when I die, you do whatever you want. So what should we do? We need the money. I say, take her to court. They say, oh, it's being undutiful and being not a good son. No, this is your God-given right. This is what courts are made for. Your mother's judgment is impaired, is wrong, is un-Islamic. Anyhow, so the two went to the Prophet and the father said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, I gave money as a charity, but put it in the wrong place. And the boy said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, I got charity that I am deserving for. So the Prophet said to the man, what you have given in charity is registered as charity. And what you have taken as a poor person is accepted. You keep the money and your charity is registered. What does this tell you? It tells you that the intention is important. If your intention is to please Allah Azza wa Jal, even if this man might be a, a, a professional beggar, and there's a possibility that he is really needy. In this case, there's no sin on you, and this is totally legit. Bi'idnillahi Azza wa Jal. Uh, Afrina, well, this question is gone. Faiza Saeed says, if someone I helped once financially keeps coming to me again and again for different needs, shall I continue helping her in my capacity or can I excuse politely? This is totally up to you. It is as described earlier. What you do for the sake of Allah is for the sake of Allah. You'll be rewarded for that. But if you are inclined that this person is using you and you've seen evidences that she's using the money for things that are not as she said, in this case, you have all the right to apologize diplomatically and not give her anything. The biggest fear I have is that you continue to give while doubtful in your heart and maybe snapping one day and spoiling everything that you've done by saying, didn't I give you so much? Why are you abusing my money? Why are you asking me? Every time you ask me, I give you. Allahu Akbar. This is a catastrophe. You should not give her anything if you're going to reach that level because this is known as al and it is one of the major sins of Islam. The Prophet said, three will never enter Jannah. And Allah would not speak to him, not look at them, and not have mercy upon them. Al-Musbilu wal mannan The one who has his garment or trousers below his ankle. And Al-Mannan, the one 
who always goes to the people who he had helped in the past and remind them of his help. Didn't I give you this and that? Didn't I help you admit your child in school? Didn't I? This is a major sin. So um, I would say it is up to you totally. If you feel that she's sincere and she's in need and she thinks well of you, then Allah has made you, made her a door and a gate for you to Jannah. The more you help her, you enter Jannah because she's needy. But if you're inclined that she's lying or using you, well, you fool me once, shame on you. You fool me twice, shame on me. Kinza says, some people say you shouldn't take a black cat as a pet because black cats are evil and they're sometimes jinn. And all is it, uh, uh, is it true or something else about black cats? Not okay. There is nothing in the Sharia that says that black cats uh, are prohibited or haram. There is nothing in the Quran or the Sunnah that states that they are jinn. Some scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah, if I, if I remember correctly, said that black cats might be jinn, but not all of them or not most of them. The possibility when a jinn would uh, uh, transform or appear in the uh, uh, shape of another animal or a cat, that it would uh, be black, but there's no evidence supporting this. There, so therefore, there's nothing wrong in taking a black cat uh, as a pet. Uh, then this question is from, I don't know who. Uh, for what type of illness is Ruqya done? I mean, for spiritual illness or uh, Ruqya can be done for physical illness like any disease, cancer, infertility, HIV, BH, HBV, and any of the like such ruqya can be done to any physical or mental or spiritual illness ruqya is a form of healing so it is a set of verses of the quran prophets hadith alayhi salatu wasalam or general dua that has a good meaning. This is what's Rukia. So it's good for cancer. It's good for your throat ache. If you're infected with Corona, may Allah protect us all. You can do Rukia and it will help. It is helpful from black magic, evil eye, envy, jinn possession, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, the whole nine yards. Because it is throwing everything in your possession to Allah Azza wa Jal, expressing your poverty and humility, seeking his healing and cure through these verses of the Quran and the good words and Allah knows best. Rabia, Rabia Ahmed says can you please kindly clarify a dua which is authentic to recite inside my salah Allahumma I think this dua of Umar Allahumma inni as'aluka shahadatan fi sabilika wa arjuka mawtan fi harami rasulika or something like that I also would like to know if randomly just simply making simple dua saying Rabbi Rahmuma Kama Rabbayani Sagiran or on every thought of my deceased father, can it be said or does it become innovation? First of all, the dua of Umar is not a sunnah. So this is a random dua that Umar may have said may Allah be pleased with him and if the narration is authentic people were wondering how could he be martyred in the cause of Allah in Medina and die in Medina 
because there are no wars within the vicinity. And when he was stabbed by Abu Lu'lu'ah al-Majusi, may Allah curse him, um, and died in Medina, they understood the manifestation of the dua. Nevertheless, you can ask Allah Azza wa Jal during your salat, whatever you want. You have debts, ask Allah to pay off your debts. You have illnesses in your, in your body, ask Allah to cure them. You fear something, ask Allah to protect you. You wish for something, ask Allah to grant you. And whenever you remember your parents and you say, there's nothing wrong in that. That's a general dua and it's an ayah mentioned in the Quran and there's no innovation in that. And if you maintain saving, saying this dua in sujood, again, there's nothing wrong in that as well. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Sherer Zed Zubair says, I'm asking Aqiqa, what are the sum of its importance? Jazakallahu khayran. This is a highly recommended sunnah. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, kullu ghulamin marhunun bi'aqiqatih. Every child born is depending on his aqiqa. Some may uh, translate marhun as mortgaged or pond. So every child that is born is dependent on his aqiqa because his aqiqa would entitle him to intercede if he dies as an, as an infant, he will intercede for his parents in Jannah. And this is a highly recommended sunnah that the Prophet did himself for his grandson Al Hassan when he slaughtered two rams on behalf of Al Hassan. And he instructed us to do that on the seventh day of the child's birth, to name the child on the seventh day, to circumcise the boy, male child, and to shave the head of the newborn, whether girl or boy, and weigh the hair that was shaved and give the equivalent of its weight in silver in charity so all of these are part of the uh, uh, recommended things to do and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best Mahboob says is my prayer valid if I do not elongate in Surah Al-Fatiha this has no impact on the validity of your Fatiha or your prayer so if I say that's it. Prayer is valid. The most best way of saying it is to say it with tajweed. But this is not mandatory. So say that's it. It does the job. Zaid Zubair says, how did the Prophet ﷺ fought hypocrites well we know that the prophet did not fight the hypocrites with the sword like disbelievers because the hypocrites pretend to be muslims while inside they're none muslims however as muslims the prophet is our role model he gave us the way not to treat the hypocrites so if it were to him, he would have killed them all because they are disbelievers. But he didn't because he's giving us a lesson. Such hypocrites who pretend to be Muslims, we can only deal with them with what shows to us. So they pretend to be Muslims, we take that as it is, as face value. What is in their heart is up to their Lord Azza wa Jal to hold them to account. Nevertheless, the Prophet ﷺ fought the hypocrites by showing us 
their characteristics, their signs, what they're well known of, how they behave. And he told us to be aware of how they act so that we don't fall in the same category. Allah described them to us in the Quran clearly. Lazy when they pray, they never remember Allah except seldomly. They are neither to the believers nor to the disbelievers and they're in between. They plot, they betray, they break promises. They do a lot of things. So these were all ways of fighting them. Once you know them, you can be aware from them and you can protect yourself and Iman from falling into their category. So scholars say that we can only fight the hypocrites by rhetoric, by exposing them, by showing the whole world. And this is nowadays extremely needed because the hypocrites now are not individuals. They are countries, they are institutions, they are people that are backed by the media. And they have influence everywhere. And you can see when someone does a sin, and we are all sinful, but you can see when someone is a hypocrite and trying to undermine Islam, sides with the Jews and the Christians against the Muslims, prefers their festivals, takes part in their religious rituals, whether they're Hindus or Christians or Jews, and they participate with them. If this is not hypocrisy, what is? So you have to expose such people and this is how we fight the hypocrites. Mashuk bin Abrar says, I've, I've heard a fatwa that if a person starts a nafil act of worship, that is nafil prayer or fasting, and doesn't finish that act, then it is wajib, it is mandatory for that person to complete it later on, meaning that he has to make it up. Is there any evidence? The answer is no, this is not true, especially with fasting and praying. Because the Prophet ﷺ said to us that when a person is fasting and he's invited to a meal, he may eat, meaning break his fast, or he may make dua. It's according to his wish. And the scholars all agree that a person fasting, voluntary fast, is his own commander, whether to continue or to break it. Prayer is the same thing, voluntary. Now, Hajj is different because once you assume Ihram and you begin in your Umrah or in your Hajj, there's no going back. You have to complete it. And if you break it by intercourse or something like that, it is mandatory for you to make it up the following year. But this is a different story and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Bin Abdullah says, Sheikh, my question is why when I'm going to do Salat, I feel anxious. Please answer. Bin Abdullah, how would I know? You need to go to a psychiatrist. You need to sit and analyze yourself. I don't know you. And I don't know why would a person feel anxious before going to Salat. There are gazillion reasons. You may be afraid of the dark and you're praying in a place that is dark. You may be afraid that you'll nullify your prayer. Maybe you all have urine incontinence or uh, um, you continuously pass gas. Maybe you have so many sins and you're afraid of meeting Allah Azza wa Jalla in prayer. I have no idea. Akhi. Whatever the reason is, no one can say why except you. So you need to sit with a psychiatrist or with, with a counselor who would listen and ask you various questions and then you may find the answer and Allah knows best. 
Ola Fimi says, if I mistakenly pray suhri, prayer one hour before its time, is my prayer valid? I don't know what suhri is. So let us assume that it is one of the five daily prayers. If you pray them an hour before its time, the prayer is invalid. If you pray it one minute before the adhan, the prayer is still invalid. Farzana bint Farooq says, or bint Fakhrul, Fakhrul has a number of questions. Number one, if a sister who has never been married wakes up at Fajr time and sees vaginal discharge and is confused whether this is from wet dream or it is natural discharge, what should she do? Nothing. The default is that she did not have an external emission. This is the default. So we would not go to saying that this is semen unless there is evidence. So if it's the normal amount of vaginal discharges, then this is vaginal discharge. But if you find a lot of it, which is unusual, then this is most likely to be nocturnal emission uh, or many, and you have to make also. Number two, the dua of intimacy. Is it to be said by the man only? The answer is yes. The wife is not to say it because this is not from the sunnah and its innovation. Number three, does the jinn and the angels that stay with me know my thoughts in my mind or, uh, or my intentions? The answer is yes. Allah has given them this ability. Fatima Afrin says, if we find a torn back note, if we find a torn back note in our wallet, which can't be returned to the owner who gave it to us, is it permissible to bend and buy things without telling the shopkeeper about the tear? This is a banknote. Some banknotes has serial number. If this is torn, usually this is worthless because the bank itself would not take it. But sometimes the torn is so little. Shops don't prefer it, but it is totally fine in banks in transactions. If it is the first, then it is totally prohibited to do this so that the shopkeeper would not see the torn and he would be fooled like you were fooled in buying it. This is cheating and it's haram. But if it's not something that is rejected, it's totally legit and accepted, there's no problem in doing that. Even if the shopkeeper does not like it, this is his problem because it's still a valid currency. Akhtar says a person, if a person sometimes feels lazy or feel like have to do recommended ibadah, voluntary prayers, etc., like it or not, whether he likes it or not, to earn rewards as it misses tranquility. Sometimes is it a sign of hypocrisy? If I understand your question correctly, you're saying that if I pray, anticipating the reward, but I don't like it. So I'm doing it because I'm forced to doing it in anticipation of the reward and I, I lack tranquility in it. Different to a person who loves it and he does it out of conviction and he loves Allah, etc. Am I sinful? Is it a sign of hypocrisy? The answer is no. It's a sign of weakness of Iman because we know that the hadith of the Prophet that the Jannah is surrounded by hateful things and hellfire is surrounded by desires. So these hateful things, people by nature find them difficult to wake up early in the morning after only a couple of hours of sleep and to walk to the masjid when it's cold or when it's too hot. And may you may not find the taste and the beauty of that. But this is not a sign of hypocrisy because you're doing it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla and Allah knows best. Rashid Kasmani says, can we pray to dua al-Qunut in the last raka'ah of witr? That is, Allahumma hdina fi man hadayt as uh, Allahumma inni inna nasta'inuka. Okay, 
So the, the first dua, Akhi, uh, Rashid or Rashid, is the dua of the Prophet, السلام, which he had taught to Al Hassan. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt wa afini fi man afayt wa tawallani fi man tawallayt. Which Al Hassan, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, came to his grandfather when he was like seven, eight years of age, asking him to teach him a dua to recite in Qunut. So this is authentic. The other dua, Allahumma inna nasta'inuka wa nasta'firuka wa nasta'hdiq wa natubu ilayk wa natawakkal alayk. All of this is not related to the Prophet This is Umar's dua. May Allah be pleased with him. And hence, abiding by the sunnah is far better. But if you do the other one, there's no problem, insha'Allah. Uh, and Allah knows best. Finally, uh, Afrina Khalida says, can I recite any of my favorite verses of the Quran before I make dua to Allah in my sujood? The answer is no. It is prohibited to recite the Quran in sujood or rukur. The only exception is if the dua you're making in sujood is from the Quran. So if I'm in sujood and I would like to recite the Fatiha, this is totally haram. If I like to recite Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, totally haram. Ayat al Kursi, totally haram. But if I want to recite Rabbana Hablana min Azwajina wa Dhurriyatina Qurrata A'yunin wa Ja'alna lil Muttaqina Imama, no problem. Rabbana Atina fi Dunya Hasana wa Fil Akhirati Hasana wa Qina Adab Nar, no problem. Because these are dua, not Quran. So reciting Quran is totally prohibited. Making dua from the Quran is totally legit. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is all the time we have, and until we meet next Monday, I leave you for Amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.